Amen. Thank you, choir. All right, this is the time that our children are dismissed to Children's Church, and our Spanish-speaking Bible study will also be dismissed as well. If you speak Espanol or know somebody who does, out the door to my right, uh, your left in the back corner, we have our Spanish Bible study. would love for you to attend that if you would be so inclined. The rest of us, let's go on now to James chapter 1. That We're working through the book of James and uh, we're in verse 19 today of the first chapter. When you find that, let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of the Word of God because God's Word is holy, it is infallible, it is inerrant, and it is the authority over our lives. James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, but be doers of the word, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he, for, he looks at himself, but goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows and their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray. Father, the very last thing that we would ever want is to either deceive ourselves or others in trying to carry a cross as though we are religious people when in fact our hearts are far, from, are far from you. So God, please give us, give us the sincerity of faith that comes from true repentance and belief and trust in Christ. And Father, I pray also that our lives would give ample, fruitful, abundant evidence that we are truly among your children. Please help us, Father, we pray. Lord, help me to preach well, to be clear, to be emphatic, and help my people whom I love to hear and to receive the implanted word which is able to save. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Whenever we drive to Ohio, if you've ever driven up 77 North, there are two huge tunnels that go through the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, Tunnels, you actually drive through the mountain. It's kind of a unique experience. There's two of them. One is called a Big Walker Mountain Tunnel, and the other is called the East River Tunnel. And if you've never driven through a mountain before, it's kind kind of a neat thing to do. We have this this little game that we play, the Everhards, whenever we drive through the mountain, we, uh, we hold our breath when we go through. Have you ever done that before? I don't know where we got that game, but we've been doing it for years, and apparently we're not the only ones that do this. It takes about 80 seconds to drive through Big Walker Mountain Tunnel. That's a long time when you're holding your breath. Obviously, we're not the only ones to do this little game because last time I drove through it, there was actually a sign that said, do not hold your breath. (laughs) Something about tickets and citations will follow. So apparently what was happening is that this game caught on. I didn't start it, but we used to do it. I don't know who started it, but people apparently do it. And what was happening is that drivers would be holding their breath going through the tunnel, and apparently they'd hold it so long that some people would actually black out and hit the wall, jam up traffic, and then everybody else would be behind them trying to hold their breath. And <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You can't do it like that. You'll, you'll pass out. You'll, you'll die if you don't if you don't breathe, and the thing is about breathing, and I'm not a pulmonary expert by any stretch of the imagination, uh, the respiratory system of the body amazes me how the blood oxyg- oxygenates the body and the, the brain and all that. I, I don't know about all these things. I do know, however, that you, ha- you have to breathe in and breathe out. 
regularly in order to live. And you would think, wouldn't you, that if you had a choice between breathing in or breathing out, you'd probably take breathing in and it would seem like, you know, you could live by just breathing in. But no, you, you have to breathe in and breathe out. And to prove that this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to have this side only breathing in for the next two moments. And this side, you can only breathe out. And we're not really going to do that because you, I wouldn't have much of a congregation this morning. But you have to breathe in and breathe out. That's the deal. You don't do that, you black out or you die, okay? James, in the book of James, has this natural flow. In the whole book, it goes something like this. You have to continually receive in truth, truth in, in the ears, in the mind, in the heart, but you have to continually breathe out or exhale obedience, life, faithfulness. And that's one of the major themes of the whole book is that you, you cannot live spiritually if you're not both taking in, receiving, and living it out faithfully in, in obedience. Okay, so that's the big idea this morning. And what I want to do is we're going to look at these couple of paragraphs here this morning. And I'm going to divide them into just two sections this morning. In the first part of the message, we're going to talk about inhaling truth, breathing in God's word, receiving it into our lives. I think that's kind of the point of verses 19 to 21. And then after that, we're going to turn the corner about halfway through the message. And I'll let you know when we do turn the corner because we're going to talk about the obedience that is required of true believers. And that's going to come in verses 22 to 27. And that's not going to be a unique thought in the book of James. You're going to hear it week in and week out in the coming months as we work through the rest of this book. So let's start with uh, the premise this morning. Breathing in truth. We're inhaling God's word. Uh, we want his, his truth, the scripture. We want to be good listeners. We want to good, be good hearers. We're receiving the word of God. Can't live without it. Okay, can't live without it. Got to breathe in truth. And listen to what he says in verses 19 to 21. I'm going to read it again. Know this, he says, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive, here you go, receive, breathe it in, inhale it, eat it, so whatever you want to use as a metaphor. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, if you write in your Bible, and I suggest that you do from time to time, you might want to highlight a couple of words here, okay? You might want to highlight the phrase quick to hear in verse 19, quick to hear, we want to be ready for hearing. And he also says a similar thing in verse 21 with a little bit of a difference in language, receive with meekness. So quickness has to do with attentiveness, readiness, okay? Did you come ready to hear the word of God this morning? Some of you did, others of you just kind of waltzed in incidentally this morning. And then this meekness idea, this idea of humility, comes in where we're going to be, we're going to be listening with, with, the, with the receptivity of the heart, okay? And so here's, here's the problem, is that a lot of us simply aren't ready listeners. We're not. We're not always meek listeners with the humility that somebody might have something important to say to you. I think about how many times uh, you, 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 have, you have not been ready to listen, not, not been meek. You, you assume you know. Like, I already know everything. What can somebody tell me? What could somebody possibly tell me that I don't already know? And a lot of us have this fault. It's a personal characteristic fault. I have it. You, you, some of you probably do as well. That you actually believe you, you probably know what's going to be said already. And that makes us, in fact, terrible listeners. We should assume in whatever conversation we're in, whether we're talking to a, a co-worker or whether we're talking to a, a madman that we meet on the street, like I told you about last week, or whether we're talking to a child, we should assume that that person has something to tell me that I don't already know. We should have a, a readiness, an attentiveness to listen, a willingness, a humility even, because what happens, right? What happens when you assume that you already know everything? I already know. You ever been to a Bible study? What you probably have. You ever been to a Bible study where you're sitting around the room and you've got your Bible open and, and everybody just wants to say what they know. They want to say what they know. They want to say what they know. And everybody's talking over each other. People aren't even letting each other finish their sentences. Have you ever been in a situ situation like that before? Raise your hand if you have. 
Like you can't even wait to say the thing that you know about the verse. You're not listening to anybody else. You're jumping in. You're jumping on top of each other. How many of you have been in a meeting? Now, don't raise your hand for this one. Maybe you've even been in a meeting that's gone this way, either an elders meeting, a deacons meeting, Christian ed meeting, missions meeting, Sunday school meeting, and everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's talking over each other. Everybody's ready to say what they know. And the problem with that is that that speaks of arrogance because you don't know everything. You have to accept the reality of your finitude. Nobody here knows everything. Any given conversation, any given conversation with somebody, they may very well say something if your ears are attuned that could actually change your life. Like I said, it could even be a child. You know, how many times have you taught a Sunday school lesson and a child says something that's almost like, in its simplicity, it's sublimely profound, and you're like, whoa, I can learn something from a child. Most of us don't even listen to each other anymore. I heard a story recently about a guy who put an ad on Craigslist, and he said this. He said, I will listen to you for one hour for $20. Immediately, he's got this small business started. People that want just somebody that would finally listen to them. Like without talking, without interrupting, without judging, without jumping in. Just somebody to finally listen. That's what a lot of us are really looking for in our lives. is somebody that finally will just listen to us because they actually care. But a lot of us, we're just, I mean, I'm just being honest. We're not very good listeners. I'll be talking to my children sometimes and... Uh, they'll say to me, Dad, are you even listening? You ever had that happen? And if I'm honest, I'm like, not really. You know, and one day they're going to be 25, 26, and they're going to be walking down the aisle getting married, and I'm going to wish, I'm going to wish that I had listened more because one day they're not going to be in my, my home anymore, and I want to appreciate the things that they say. I want to, I want to learn, even from my own children. And so James says we have to be listeners. Now, who should we listen to? Well, everybody, but let me give you a couple of specific groups that I would say we should probably listen to more. How about the elderly? Should we listen to the elderly? Absolutely. Why? Because they have experience that you don't have. Like your life is limited chronologically. Your, your life is limited perspectively. You've only experienced so much of history. I, I would give almost anything today to talk to my grandfathers again. They're both gone, but to to hear them talk one more time about the war or the depression or what they learned as they built up their businesses and tried to feed their families and got through the hard times and the good, I would almost kill to hear my grandfathers tell me about these things again. And unfortunately, when I was young, I didn't care. Now I care, and they're gone. Listen to the elderly. They have something to tell you. Listen to the pious. Listen to the godly. Listen to the people whose lives you look at and you say, that's what I want to become. You know anybody like that? You know people that are passionate Christ followers, that they love Jesus and, and, and their lives give evidence to the fact that they've been with Christ. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Acts 4.13, that they, they recognized that the disciples had been with the Lord and there was just something about them. They had the, the ethos, the, the smell, the fragrance of Christ was upon them and probably all of us know a few people like that at the very least that just, that just, they just emanate Christ. Listen to those people. Listen to them, sit down with them, schedule a coffee meeting and say, I just want to hear you talk about your relationship with Christ because you obviously have something that I don't and I want it. So listen to that. Now listen to experts. There's another group. Listen to people that have specialized knowledge in certain things. These kind of people absolutely fascinate me. There are people in this room today, I guarantee you, that know something that is so nuanced in particular, a field of study that maybe they've endeavored in or a trade that they have. They have some skill, some field of knowledge that you know absolutely nothing about. And whenever I find people like that, I love for them to just tell me how you do it. Tell me what, what you do. How do you do it? You're, you're an arc welder. Great. I've never welded in my life. Tell me about that that like you can repair a transmission that is so cool I can't even change my own oil in my car tell me about how to change a transmission or somebody who's got advanced knowledge in archaeology or astronomy or theology or or world history like I love people that have specialized knowledge seek them out and listen to them all right I'll give you another group listen to your enemies would you please Would you please just listen to some of your opponents, your intellectual opponents, your political opponents? Listen to people that disagree with you. I'll tell you why. Because you can actually, I know you're not going to believe this, 
you can actually learn something from your opponents and your intellectual enemies. Did you know that? Like, if you would just stop refuting their arguments before they've even had a chance to say what they believe and actually listen in, take it in. I listen to a radio station every day when I drive from which I agree with almost nothing. Sometimes I do it just because I want to be irritated a bit. Like, I'm in too good of a mood today. I'm going to turn on the channel that ruins that mood. But, but sometimes... You know, sometimes I listen to that particular channel on the radio because I actually want to know why people think the way they do. What is it that drives you to believe and to act the way you do? I think it's crazy. Explain it to me. I want to hear it. Might even learn anything. Might learn something. All right, so let me break this down really simply, and maybe this is going to be super duper obvious, but let's talk about how to listen for a minute. I'm going to give you three levels of listening. Level one, listening with the ear. You say, well, how else would you listen? (laughs) Right, okay, so you listen to the words that people actually say. This This is called listening at the ear level. You're asking yourself, why did he say that? Why did he use that word? Why did she use that tone of voice? You're actually trying to listen to what they're telling you, the words. Why do you phrase it that way? Why did she say it with that tone of voice? Why didn't they use this? I don't even know what that word was. You're listening to what they're actually telling you, and you're not trying to predict it, okay? Now, here's the problem, is a lot of us hear what we want to hear, okay? We're even filling in the sentences for other people before they're even finished saying them. We're guessing what they're going to say next, and all the time we're doing that, we've actually stopped listening at the very basic ear level. But there's more to that. You say, how could there be more to listening than just listening with the ear? Well, that's the surface level. That's the very most basic level is listening of what did they say and don't misrepresent their actual words. Listen to them, okay? Second level, though, there's, a, there's another level. Listen with the mind. You listen to their words, but you're listening with the mind. What are you listening for? You're listening for their logic. Are they being persuasive? Are they being logically coherent. You know, today in the universities, this really bothers me, today there's this whole thing in the universities, and if you're going to college or a university right now, you know this, where they, they issue what's called a trigger warning. Have you heard of this? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Trigger warning, okay, is you're going to either read something or hear something that might possibly be offensive to you, so be careful. Do you know we could just, we could just disband the whole trigger warning nonsense, if we would teach people to use logic again. They used to teach that in the schools and the universities. Logic. What is logic? Logic is listening with the mind, so you are analyzing the rhetorical persuasiveness of an argument that somebody is making to you, and you're looking for things like informal fallacies. What in the world is that? Informal fallacy. Circular reasoning. Have you ever heard of circular reasoning before? happens all the time. Somebody makes an argument from the basis of the very premise that they're trying to establish using it as a foundation. That's not persuasive. Okay. Straw man arguments. Listen for straw man arguments. A straw man argument is when somebody intentionally mischaracterizes an argument, makes it look stupid or weak so that they can smash it down. Don't be persuaded when people use straw man arguments. It's not persuasive. Ad hominem, it's when you attack the other guy. You attack him verbally. We call it name calling or mudslinging or whatever you want to call it. You should not be persuaded by ad hominem arguments. They're not persuasive. Ad populum, everybody believes that. Well, no. First of all, not everybody believes that. And second of all, even if they did, that doesn't necessarily persuade me as a person, okay? So if you're more interested in informal fallacies, I have a little article I put out in the informational kiosk. You can learn about them. It's especially to know your informal fallacies during debate season and election time because you're going to hear a lot of fallacies on the radio and on the television. Amen? So you're listening at the ear level and the mind level, but here's here's the last one. You have to listen with the level of the heart. This is last, not first. Last, not first. You're listening with the heart. Are they actually saying something that might change my life right now? Like, even if I disagree with them, 
Does it prompt something in me to repent? Does it prompt something in me to believe? Does it prompt something in me to change my life? Maybe it does. And if you never let it go down to the heart level, then you'll find that your life is not being changed and you end up being the same curmudgeon hard-hearted person that you've been the whole time. And it's no good. It's no good. So we're listening at all three levels, the ear, the mind, and the heart. Now look at this, though. Go back to the text. If you close the text, fix that. Because he talks about a particular kind of hearing in verse 21 that transcends in importance the average hearing of everyday conversations. Look at 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, what? The implanted word which is able to save your souls. How much more so then ought we to be listening when the word of God is being read or exposited in the church or in Bible study or on Wednesday nights, whatever it is, there is a kind of listening that actually has the ability to save your souls. When the implanted word is being distributed, what is that? That's scripture. That's the gospel. Of course, there's a metaphor here. There's a, there's a biological uh, metaphor here of implantation. That's when the seed right, hits the rich soil and it germinates into life producing fruits, where have we heard that before? Well, James, the brother of Christ, is hearkening back to one of the Savior's teachings, and let's actually go look at it back in Matthew chapter 13. The parable of the sower is most likely what's being referred to here with this image of the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18, here then, The parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. Okay? So there's threats here. There's existential threats to the word of God implanting in your heart. You have an enemy that doesn't want you to hear it. Some of you who are distracted or bothered or look at your your phones right now, you might actually be subject to the wiles of the enemy as he comes to snatch away the seed that's even been scattered, being scattered right here in church today. Verse 20, as for what has been sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. All right, he falls away. 22, as for what has been sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. 23, now here's what we want to be, faith church, but as for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another 60 and another 30. If you want to bear fruit in your life, Okay, it begins with listening to the word of God and when that seed hits the soil of your heart and your heart has been made ready by the sower himself, life change. Okay, life change. Now, let's turn the corner and we're gonna go to the second half of the message now because James has something to say about listening, we're inhaling, we're breathing in truth, we're getting truth, scripture, the gospel, I want it in my bloodstream, I want it in my my heart, I want it in my brain, I want to be breathing in truth, but he says, better not stop there. Breathe in, breathe out. You don't do both and you die or you become a hypocrite or a Pharisee, or an antinomian, or something worse than that. Look at verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Okay, here's the emphasis now. Breathe out life, obedience, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What good is it if you know every verse of the Bible and apply none of them? What good is it if you know every question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, but you don't catechize your children in the truth? What good is it if you know your theology and you don't love your wife? What good is it if you know five points of evangelism but you never go to your neighbor's house to share the gospel? What good is it if you can define the difference between justification and sanctification but there's no evidence of either in your life? It's a problem. Breathe in, breathe out, and then James gives this illustration. It's brilliant, actually. Look at verse 22. 
Uh, 23 actually, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Some of you did that this morning. He looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he'll be blessed in his doing. So James actually gives this picture. He's like, he says like, all right, here's how you know. If you're, if you're breathing in and breathing out, imagine yourself going to a mirror. You, you, look, you look, okay? What, what's going on in my face? Well, I got, I got morning goober in my eye. I got broccoli in my teeth. I got a breakout on my forehead. My beard, well, that's good. Beard's good. <laughs> you got all this knowledge and you walk away from the mirror and you do nothing to apply it. What would we say? What would we say about a person who sees the broccoli in his teeth and doesn't take a step to correct it? We'd say that person has a serious disconnect between his knowledge and his life. All right? There's a disconnect, and that's a problem. Now, here comes the, the most difficult paragraph in this whole section. You ready? Let's look at the last paragraph in verse 26 and following, okay? And I'm going to apologize in advance because this is hard to hear it. It's hard for me to say it, okay? I'm no better than you. I'm up here this morning. You're out there, but believe me, this cuts me as deep as it cuts you. But we got to go there because it's in the Bible. Verse 26, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, that person's religion is worthless. There's a very strong possibility you know, some of us might actually be deceived about our status, deceived about our own status with the Lord, our, our own religiosity. It's possible that it's a sham. Okay, that's what he's saying here. He's saying it's possible if anyone thinks he's religious, you think you're religious. Okay, good. You got a fish sticker on your car. So what? You got an ESV Bible in your hand. So what? You got a Christian tattoo. So what? You got your station turned to, to Moody Bible Institute in your truck. So what? Question is, is it real? Is it real? How would I know that? Well, well here's how I'm going to know that. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, that word religion right there in verse 27, that word has been kicked around like a soccer ball in the last 50 years. That word has a terrible connotation these days, but I want to tell you that it didn't used to. There used to be a day that the word religion was actually a positive term. Maybe some of you are old enough to even remember back when the word religion was a good thing. Okay? The Puritans, if you ever read the Puritans, they always use the word religion positively, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, the word religion for the Puritans uh, stood for the truth of Christian doctrine met with right practice in the church and the family and the life. If we were to ask a Puritan, what does religion mean? They'd say, good stuff, strong Christian teaching with right application in life. However, what's happened to the word religion? What happened to the word? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what happened to the word religion. This is why we don't think of it positively today. Uh, there was this guy called Billy Graham in the 20th century, the 1900s. You remember him? Wonderful, godly evangelist. I love Billy Graham. My esteem for him is about here, okay? But in order to counter what would seem to be kind of a, a practical, rote memory, uh, very outward form type of religiosity in his day, Billy Graham and some other evangelists began talking about a distinction between religion and relationship with God, as though those two things were a dichotomy, okay? And, and they, he would preach things like this. He'd say, hey, religion isn't enough. You need a relationship with your Father in heaven. And man, how true is that? That's true, right? Isn't that true? Like, who would debate that? Not me. You wouldn't hear me debate that. You need to have a relationship with your heavenly father. You need to become a child of God. Scripture even calls Christ our friend. So there's absolute truth to this idea that we need to be in a real saving relationship with Christ, not as peers, not as buddies, but a savior 
and saved or redeemer and the redeemed sort of covenantal relationship. All of that is true, yes, and amen. But in that dichotomy, the unfortunate byproduct was that is that the word religion began to be kind of pushed off as though there was something wrong or deformed with that word. And so today, this is what you'll hear on the street. Okay? Go out and ask 100 people in the streets of Brooksville about the word religion, and here's what they'll tell you. And I will quote, I'm spiritual, fill it in, but not religious. What does that mean? What in the world does that even mean? You, who do you pray to? Like, what, what prayers do you pray? How do you serve? What do you do? What do you believe? What do you confess? They might not even know. They might just simply say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, because they think that that's the right thing to say. And who's going to deny that they're spiritual? Who's going to say that? I'm not spiritual at all. Nobody's going to say that. And so everybody says, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And so in the meanwhile, the word religion has once again just kind of like been, been pushed off. Now, let's correct it. Let's correct that error today, because the Bible actually gives us a very good definition of the word religion and it's right here in our text before us this is actually what we want and this is a very good thing rightly understood verse 27 religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to do what visit orphans and widows and their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world so you think you're religious do you you think you got Christianity under wraps question you have a compassionate heart for widows and orphans? Are you keeping yourself unstained from the world? In other words, are you pursuing personal holiness in your life? That's true religion. In fact, we might even say, here's a, here's a Latin phrase for you, that care for the orphans and the widows and their affliction in keeping one stain, un, oneself unstained from the world is the sine qua non of Christianity, the sine qua non, Latin phrase. It means without which, not. Sine qua non. I'll give you an example. We could say that what is the sine qua non of baseball? Can you play baseball if you're not in a stadium? Of course. Can you play baseball if you're on the streets instead of in the park? Yes. Can you play baseball without mitts? What do you think? Can you play baseball without a ball? Sine qua non, without which not. What is the sine qua non of Christianity? It's right here. It's right in front of us. Care for the widows and the orphans and keeping yourself unstained from the world. If you push that off, we're not talking about Christianity anymore. It's something else. Something less, something worse, something deformed, something diminutive. Here's why this passage is so hard. Are you actually doing this stuff? Are you actually doing this stuff? Like widows and, and orphans, is that a metaphor? Does that stand for something else? Are we, is there any unclarity about what widows and orphans actually means in this context? Okay, now, Anthony and I had an interesting conversation this week. We're talking about the phrase widows and orphans. We decided that this is a Hebrew merism. A merism is the idea that you have the two opposite extremes of something, but it stands for the whole. Okay, like when we say that the Lord created the heavens and the earth, that's a merism. It means he created for everything from up here to down here. And so while certainly orphans and widows are included in the group, it's not exclusive of everything in between. So in other words, does this phrase widows and orphans, would that include for you the handicapped, yes or no? Of course. Would this include for you the cognitively degenerate, those who are struggling mentally, Yes. Does this phrase include the poor? I think so. But at some point, you actually have to do the stuff. So wouldn't it be amazing if today, here we are, 
what is it, quarter to noon? Wouldn't it be awesome if the Lord actually moved in somebody's heart that today's the day they're like, I'm going to adopt because of this passage. I'm going to adopt. I'm going to actually visit a widow today. Wouldn't that be an incredible solution, resolution to the sermon today? I think it'd be absolutely amazing if God were to move in somebody's heart today that they look at this passage and they're like, man, I don't know if I've been fooling myself about this Christianity thing, but I don't necessarily see these two things in my life, this compassion angle, this personal holiness angle. Wouldn't it be amazing if God actually moved so that some of us today would actually go out into our communities and begin to serve, to find, to seek, to love, to gather in, Everyone between the orphans, which would be the youngest, and the widows, which in this case are in the older pole, and begin to serve them with the gospel. Wouldn't that be amazing? Of course, that would be absolutely amazing. So let me tell you a story, and then we're going to wrap this up for this morning. Just a quick story. Hope you'll appreciate this. Uh, John Wimber is the founder of the denomination called the Vineyard Church. Now, we have a, a vineyard church here in Brooksville, and the pastor, Hal Hester, is one of my good buddies, okay? So we disagree with the vineyard on a couple of little things, not a big deal, but, but hey, we can learn from everybody, right? Wasn't that the point of the first point? We can learn from everybody. Well, John Wimber, the founder of this movement, um, he got saved as a young man primarily from reading his Bible. Uh, He particularly fell in love with the Jesus of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he he looked at Christ, and uh, not being a church guy yet in his life, he looked at Christ and he saw this this incredible, loving person who goes out and he he touches the lepers and he heals them and he's constantly caring for for the widows and he's he's doing ministry with the poor and he's feeding the poor, feeding to the 5,000 and he's welcoming children onto his lap and he's blessing people with his hands and and John Wimber says, okay, well if this is Christianity then yes sir, give me more, I want more of this and so he goes to the church and he he goes to church and he's expecting this, he's expecting to see this and, and and on this particular Sunday, they, they, there's a sermon, and there were some songs, and there was some music, and there was some fellowship, and then that was it. And he's scratching his head, and he's like, when do they do this stuff? So he goes back the next week, and, and it's the same thing. There's a sermon, and there's some, some preaching, and, and some singing, and some hymns, and, and, and again, that's it. They leave, and they go out the door, and then finally, the third week, uh, he raises his hand at the end of the church service, and he says, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but... But when do you do the stuff? What stuff? When do you do the stuff? This stuff, when do you do it? And so there was this incredible disconnect, at least in that church setting. I hope that church wasn't Presbyterian. (laughs) I hope it wasn't Presbyterian, but there's a disconnect. The outward form of religion versus the it was the internal heart of life change. And so he founded a movement of churches that are going to go do the stuff. And so I would say to you, Faith Church, let's do the stuff. Amen? Father, we love you. Thank you for our time together in the Word today. You are so powerful, God. You're, every line of this book just stabs me in the heart. And thank you for the surgery that you do Uh, in our hearts through the preaching of the word of God. Lord, we do want to do the stuff. Empower us, Father. Empower us that we can live and serve this community in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together for the benediction. After church, the elders will be on this side of the room. If you'd like to pray to receive Christ or if you have uh, troubles in your life and you'd like to talk to somebody that will actually listen to you, The elders will be available. That's a hint, elders. Got to listen to that. (laughs) On this side of the room, the deacons will be ready. If you have material or financial needs, then please speak with one of the deacons. Uh, Be blessed now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Love you. Have a great week.